In this video, I'm going to address a uh, question that someone sent regarding a song that they listened to. And um, so they indicated that this is one of their favorite songs and they wanted to get my, uh, my feedback. The song is called So Will I. And in parentheses, it says 100 billion times. So I don't know if it's also called So Will I 100 billion times or if that jogs your memory in terms of, uh, of what you, whether or not you've heard the song. It starts out, God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time, with no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light. So that might also jog your memory about which one we're talking about. It's a very popular song in contemporary counterfeit Christianity. It's sung by Hillsong. It's also sung by Bethel Church. Does that right there raise any flags for you? So for me, it raises flags immediately right there before I even listen to the song. And the reason why is because of the spirit that is behind those churches. So the thing that we want to understand is, particularly if you're claiming that there's some that something you have or are producing is of God, but you're in a counterfeit church and you're singing for that counterfeit church, there's probably something wrong. There's probably going to be deception, whether it's with knowledge or without knowledge, it doesn't matter because it's all there's already deception you're already serving a lie. So that's something we very we, we want to be aware of from the very beginning. Hillsong and Bethel are absolute counterfeit Christianity. They teach the Jesus chases us gospel. They twist around scripture to make it seem like we don't have any responsibility to God. We just need to believe more. Um, I know that Bethel in particular is a church that teaches people how to prophesy, kind of like, you know, charismatic traditions that teach people how to speak in tongues. You can't teach someone a gift. Where in the Bible was someone being taught a gift by anyone but God? And 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 here's the thing is like when God was teaching Jeremiah and he was saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? I see an almond branch. Very good. I'm watching to make sure that things that my word is fulfilled. That was God teaching Jeremiah how to look and listen and perceive the things that, that, the ways that God speaks and only that's reserved for God. And so if Jeremiah, or excuse me, if God is going to then give Jeremiah the gift of prophecy, which by the way, is not a psychic reading, is actually a position in wit of great authority where, so you, you, if you have a position of great authority in God, you have to also know that you're going to be very low in God that you are going to be incredibly low. You have to be brought low in order to be brought high by God. And he's going to keep you very low in order for his power to rest on you. And if you want to know where that is in scripture, how about look at every single example of every prophet God has ever appointed. You can also listen to the experience of Paul. You can also look and see that God's servants are persecuted and killed. That's not a position of great authority and honor in the world. But what Bethel does is they exalt, they teach people how to prophesy from the delusions of their own minds. They teach people to say, thus saith the Lord. Oh my goodness. It's so bad. It's so bad. And then they exalt those people. And I've seen all of counterfeit Christianity do that. Oh, my, I remember someone telling me years ago, my friend is, is in the position of prophet and would just hold this person up all the time. And I was thinking, if you even understood what a prophet does, you would know that they're hated. They're completely disrespected. They're not held in the idolatrous regard that you're holding this person in. So woe to you when people speak well of you for in the same way they did, they spoke well of the pro false prophets before you. This should give you clues as to what's going on with God's actual people. So I want to say that right off the bat, right off the bat, I have concerns uh, you know, if it's something that's come, if it's a song that's coming from Hillsong or Bethel, I'm going to assume that there's going to be false doctrine because I know that their doctrine is incorrect and, and music is doctrine. You're just singing the doctrine. And I really want to encourage you to think of music in that way. You are singing doctrine. And so if those lyrics, if the message is incorrect, the doctrine is incorrect. What you're putting out there, what you're bringing into your heart, it's going to be false. 
So it's, it's very dangerous. Music can be very dangerous in that regard. Think of all the music you listen to in the world and how that, how that made an impression on what you thought about love, for example, about love stories, for example, about how love is supposed to go, how you're supposed to feel. It makes quite an impression on you. And then think about music videos and television. All of these things are indoctrinating because they bring a doctrine. So you have to be aware of that. The thing about praise, you know, singing praise is that now we're disrespecting God with our praise if we're singing false doctrine. And the purpose of music is to praise him. You see that in the word. You don't see any example of people just listening to music for themselves. They're using music to praise God. Okay, let's take a look at a few lines in, uh, in this song. For once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. What's wrong there? What's wrong in that statement? For once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. Oh, we're talking about a different God if we're saying that science follows this God because science is not something that God created. Science is a field that fundamentally denies that we have a creator and claims that we have evolved. And you're actually going to see that language a little further on in the song. So no, science is not something God created. He created everything and the whatever principles go along with those things, which you can observe. But when you start postulating and philosophizing and then, tr- and then coveting and usurping God's creations, that's science. That is the field of science. So for once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. Um, no, we're not talking about the same God. And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath. Not sure what that means. Evolving in pursuit of what you said. No, we don't evolve. We're not evolving. We're growing. We're being built. And it is an intentional effort on both parts. It's an intentional effort on God's part. And it's an intentional effort on our part to receive and submit to what God is doing. We're not evolving. And evolution implies that this is just something that is happening to us. Guess what? So does Christian, counterfeit Christianity. They also imply that salvation and, and growth are just happening to us. Like, you know, Jesus paid it all kind of thing. The, the compassion that asks for nothing in return. No. No, he asks for a lot in return, it turns out. So this is assuming certain language that science follows the sound of his voice and actually science follows the voice of somebody else, right? The antichrist, that spirit that denies Christ. Evolving is the language of the antichrist. That's the language that he chose to use in this science. So there are two red flags right there. And now we have a statement here as to a canvas of your grace. So it's talking about nature and the planets and whatever else. And it says, this is a canvas of your grace. What's grace? It's not a canvas of your grace. What does that mean? What is grace, guys? These are just poetic words that are empty. Grace is is an opportunity that's been extended to us, and it's something that we need to receive through submission, obedience, and reliance. How is nature a canvas of that? No, it tells us nothing. You know, what this song is doing and what counterfeit Christian lyrics do is they have poetic, empty poetic words that have a catchy, you know, jingle or melody or whatever. And that's it. It just entertains our flesh. The words are completely empty. I don't know what that means. For nature to be a canvas of your grace. I mean, you got to pack, you know, unpack what grace actually is. It is mercy, the mercy and sovereign choice of God. It's not unmerited favor. I don't know where people get that definition because that definition is not in the Bible. That definition came from man's interpretation of Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace, you've been saved through faith. Through faith. Hello, the first sentence tells you that there's something you got to do and there's something you got to receive, obedience, submission, and reliance. 
that this is an interactive covenant. It's not a covenant in which it's just bestowed to you. Otherwise, why would God just keep you here on the earth? Are we just waiting this out or what? I mean, that's ridiculous. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. No. Now listen, grace is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works. However, James says faith without works is dead. So you're not going to be saved by dead faith. So he's not saying that you do not produce works. What he's saying is you can't be saved by works. Okay? Not as a result of works so that no one may boast. He wants to make sure that your heart is in a position to understand that this is the mercy and sovereign choice of God to destine those for mercy and not those for, and not for wrath. Though there are those who've been destined for wrath and we've been told that very clearly in the word. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In Romans 9, we see God's heart. We see that God wants people who know that they have been given this opportunity to be saved by his grace, his mercy, and his sovereign choice. Not unmerited favor. His mercy and sovereign choice. Listen, you don't get that favor until you actually fulfill your covenant and respond to that invitation. You understand that? You've not just been, been given carte blanche favor. That's ridiculous. That is false, false Christianity. So a canvas of grace, what does that mean? That's just poetic emptiness. Next line, you chased down my heart. Is that how God does it? He chased down our heart. You know how God did it with me? He brought me to the brink of death. He handed me over to Satan to be beat down so that my flesh was completely broken and then he spoke to me. Does that mean he chased me down? No, he brought me into position. And see, that's the thing about counterfeit Christianity is they like to make it seem like God just go, oh, he's just chasing you all day. No, he hands you over to be slapped around a little bit so that you will discipline according to what he wants, according to what he knows is good. He doesn't chase you around. It, this is not a covenant in which God conforms to you. It is a covenant in which God causes you to conform to him. But counterfeit Christianity is so wicked, they, they, don't, they don't even conceive of that. They don't get it, and they don't want to get it. Through all of my failure and pride on a hill you created, the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die. I have no clue what that word salad is. Through all of my failure and pride on a hill you created, the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die. What? Maybe what they're saying is that the failure and pride are supposed to die on that hill. I, I, I don't know what that's all I have to say about that is what is that supposed to mean something to me? Cause it doesn't. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. Um, no, that's not how it goes. Your sin has not just disappeared before the eyes of God. Your sin has been forgiven provided that you are continuing to engage in a process of repentance. And my experience actually doing this is that God convicts me of the things I've done in the past. And as I'm responding to him and I'm repenting for those things and I'm changing and I'm asking him, Lord, is this still in my heart? Because if you're convicting me of it, there's probably something in my heart that I need to address. You know, contrary to this do you believe in Jesus? Did you believe that he rose three days later? Donk, you're a Christian. You're clean now. That isn't, that's not baptism, guys. Baptism was repentance. People understood that this was a baptism of repentance that John was preaching, which means that you should have engaged in a process of repentance. I should have engaged in a process of repentance. God is bringing us through repentance, and he says, in repentance and rest is your salvation and quietness and trust is your strength. Your failures don't disappear. My failures have not disappeared. In fact, why would I have had to go through all of that? God wants me to know who I've been. He wants me to be humbled by who I've been. When he gives me the eyes to see, he does not want me to forget, close the door on, or think that my sin has magically disappeared. He's not a sorcerer, he's God. 
And all of that that he took me through was necessary. And all of it is intended to build me. And if I, if it just disappears and that's my attitude towards who I've been, first of all, I never learn how to repent. I never learn how to engage in a process of change. And second of all, I'm spurning the ministry of God. I'm assuming that, no, all of that's gone. So I don't need to go back there. I don't need to examine who I've been. I don't need to be built by the things God has sent. I just start anew. There was a point in my dad's life where he decided to be baptized again in the Mormon church. And we all received phone calls that were kind of like, I'm sorry for everything I've done. And though we loved my dad and and wanted to forgive him, it was really shallow and empty. And it was not for us. Because when you are apologizing, when you are truly, when you truly are experiencing godly grief rather than your own fear that you're going to have to experience consequences, you actually acknowledge the things that you've done because that's how people know whether it's safe to engage with you is whether or not you have any insight about what you've done to people. I'm going to assume by the fact that my father killed himself that it didn't work for him. It didn't make it better. It didn't make him feel any better because he hadn't engaged in the process of repentance. I still hope and pray that there's a second chance for my dad, but I also hope and pray that his repentance is going to be substantial, that it's not going to be this wicked and lazy gimme, gimme, gimme with no, you know, absolve me of my consequences, make all of this disappear for me. That is not reality. That's not a person who lives in reality. And it's not a person who has a real depth of relationship with God and understands what God requires. I don't think any of the parents in my family have ever gone back to their kids and actually really acknowledge, examine and acknowledge what they've done to their kids. That's a Real problem, guys. Your failures never disappear, and they never disappear in the hearts of your children who have been wounded by your failures. And I'm going to go as far as to say, how dare any parent who thinks that they don't have a responsibility to examine themselves and go and acknowledge that before their children? That's going to affect your children's relationship with God. If the first authorities they have are not acknowledging their fallibility, how can a child ever transition to an authority, an ultimate authority who loves them and who they can trust? And those of you who are doing the healing work, the healing work in workshop in Heart Known series, you know that all too well, don't you? You're very aware of the ways that these experiences, early experiences, and the authority that God gave your parents, how that has affected your relationship with him and how now you're tasked with the responsibility of healing from significant damage. So no, when you are forgiven, your sin doesn't disappear. As a matter of fact, it's ever before you and God convicts you of it and he moves you to understand who you are right now and what you've been given. If it disappears, then you become a person who feels entitled who forgets who you've been, you become puffed up and proud and deluded. You're the one who never leaves the one behind. That's the last um, line that I identified. You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Well, there are going to be a lot more who are left behind than those who are in the fold. So here's the thing that I never see being taught in counterfeit Christianity. If you are claiming to be saved If you are claiming to be in that category of being predestined for mercy, you better be bearing the fruit. And if you're not bearing the fruit, you will be left behind, actually. So when he's talking about leaving the the 99 to go get that one, what he's talking about are those whom the Father chose for him. And he, he prays about that in the Garden of Gethsemane. And in that prayer, he says, I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for those you've chosen for me. And then in his life, he demonstrated how he identified the ones who the father had chosen for him. How did he identify? The way that he identified was whether or not they could hear his message. I had someone say to me, I still want to be your sister and friend. 
Okay, well, let's see if you're repentant. Let's see if you are my sister and friend because I don't go around choosing who my sister, brother, friend, I I don't go around choosing that. God has already chosen that for me. And God said that those who are his mother, brother, sister are those who do the will of his father in heaven. And so if I reprove you and you can't receive it and you turn back and attack me because I'm reproving you based on truth, you are not my sister or friend. I'm not here to be friends with everyone. I'm not here to, to start a family with the people I'm choosing to be in my family. That's a worldly construct. I'm here finding those with whom I am in an eternal family based on whether they do the will of my father who is in heaven, period. If they're accusing and attacking me because they don't like what I say based on scripture, I'm going to discern that they're not my brother, sister, mother, friend, because I'm not the one making that decision. I'm not the one who predestined me or any of you. If that's harsh, you got to take that up with God because that's the standard he established. So all this to say, this song is false, guys. This song is counterfeit Christianity. That's what they're espousing. That's what they're promoting based on the authority of the world. And you should be able to see that by their mere mention of science. If you come across songs that are put out by certain churches, you know, anytime that I'm listening to someone or I'm discerning whether or not what they're singing is true, I look up what church are they associated with? Are they associated with any church? Let's put it that way. Because if they're associated with the church, I automatically know that the spirit that is in them is the same spirit that's in that counterfeit church. A church is not the church. The church is in the believer. A church is counterfeit. Every single one of them, counterfeit. There's only one church and they assemble and they don't refer to themselves as a church. They refer to themselves as the church. And they understand that that doesn't have anything to do with some branding that someone did by naming it something or having it contained within, you know, some cathedral or whatever. No, a church all around the world taking nothing for themselves, certainly not preaching tithing, which was already fulfilled, certainly does not have a cross in its sanctuary or on its steeple or anywhere else, or a picture of Jesus, or little statues and other images celebrating Easter and Christmas. No, that's not the church. The church is defined in John 4. It's in the believer. Those who worship God in the spirit and in truth, true worshipers must worship God in the spirit and in truth, the spirit and his word. And so when we're coming together, that's how we worship, in the spirit and in truth. For that reason, we've established something uh, recently where we're inserting these moments of a pause, of silence, and being comfortable with that. And we're not there, you know, validating each other. We're not there to have conversations during worship. We're there to live by the spirit and, and to be submitted and obedient to God's spirit so that he can bring us together in unity by that spirit and he can speak through us. That's what we're there for, because nothing that we're doing of ourselves is of any consequence, is of any use to God. I, I think that it, I, I'm leaning towards and feeling, and I'm still discerning this with God, so I want to put that out there. I'm still discerning it with him, but I, I believe that, the, that he is leaning me towards us writing our own hymns. It doesn't have to be anything special, you know? We can bring that, and we can also discern other hymns, but I'm not having very much uh, success at being able to find songs that are actually true. So I just want to put that out there to you that it's perfectly okay for you to write a hymn or a song that God has put on your heart and to share that with us. If that's what God has put on your heart, make sure that it's correct. Make sure that you're discerning with him. I have actually, you know, I've, I've done a fair bit of writing, uh, the poems that I've, that I wrote in the, um, in Heart Known series, the stories that I wrote, those are pretty close to, you know, probably close to what we would be doing. I also, there's an activity in there where I talk about writing a Psalm of our own to God. That's what the, ch- the church was doing that. I mean, that's what Paul was talking about. If, you know, each of you brings a hymn, a word of instruction, a tongue, etc. If that's how God is moving you, then go with what he's doing. 
Every week he's brought us in deeper. Every week he's bringing us together in unity by his spirit. This is what he's putting on my heart this week. If he puts it on your heart, then feel free to do it. This assembly that we're engaging in is about all of us. It's about all of us coming together in unity as his church. It's not about me. I have simply been placed in a role to make sure that righteousness is the plumb line, right? That what we're doing is correct and true and with good order in worship. That's it. As a capstone to make all of the pieces click together. All of the stones click together. That's what we're doing when we come together. It, has, it is not my group. I don't own it. I'm blessed to be a servant in it alongside with you. Okay. I hope that's helpful. Please always discern everything that I say with God. And I look forward to hearing anything that he's doing in you or how he's convicting you, uh, you know, with regard to this topic.